Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from today. Thank you for uh, for for joining us, and I'm really excited to have uh, Tommy, uh, Kelsey, and and Logan with us today uh, to uh, explore a topic that is not typically well explored, and that is prioritizing disability inclusion in health research. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, let me not uh, uh, hold things up too much and hand over the podium uh, to Logan, who will get us uh, who will get us started. Thanks, Pierre. Um, so I'll just wait until Heather puts the screen up. Pierre, you have to stop sharing. There we go. Okay. There we go. Uh, looking for the button. There you go. So welcome to our webinar. Um, as Pierre said, it's on prioritizing disability inclusion in health research. And my name's Logan, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and I am one of the chairs of the National Youth Advisory um, Advocacy Council. Still getting used to the new name. Um, Kelsey, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey. I'm part of the ENYAC with Logan, and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Ottawa in Rehab Sciences. Tommy? Hello, my name is Tommy Aquino, and I'm also a member of ENYAC, and I'm a second-year student at Toronto Metropolitan University. So our, um, Heather, can you just move it to the learning objectives slide? Um, actually, sorry, the slide before. Um, so the goal of the webinar is to explore the importance of including people with disabilities in EIDI focused health research. And we will define key concepts such as tokenism, infantilization, and explore why certain environments are inclusive or non-inclusive and um, discuss those, um, what people can do to make health research more, um, more inclusive for people with disabilities. So Heather, you can move on to the next slide. Is it on the learning objective slide now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so our learning objective is to understand the benefits um, and the principles of inclusive research practices, learning how to design research that is inclusive of people with disabilities as critical partners, and defining key concepts within EDIDI in health research and exploring the um, ethical, social, and practical importance of inclusion of people with disabilities within this type of research and explaining why the concept of inclusion, inclusion is often an afterthought for people with disabilities within EDIDI-focused health research. I think it's over to you, Kelsey. The webinar session outline? Yeah. Sorry, it um the slides seem to have gone a little crazy. Give me a second here. Sorry. No, no, it's all good. I just I didn't know, Logan, are you still doing the ones after the um the webinar outline? Because I had prepared for um the privilege. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm doing the okay. one. I just want to double check because I prepared no for a no worries. We're good. slide 10 okay. and I think it was 11. Okay, we're, we should be good now. All right. So just as an overview, we're going to be discussing what is a non-inclusive environment. Uh, 
what is inclusion and how to prioritize disability in research. Uh, Logan will go over the idea and health research. I will go over defining concepts, specifically system of inequality, privilege and power, while Tommy will go through tokenism and infantilization. And then we will have uh, ending the session with a Q&A. You can switch slides, Heather. Great. So um, as, as Kelsey said, I'll be um, going over what non-inclusive environments might look like within health research. And then the main topic would be like not adapting to individual needs and or accommodation requests for the participants and or the research team, um, like or the consultants with disabilities like ourselves um, who are on the research team and um, and they use uh, jargon and they don't use lay language and the lack of applicability and generaliz generalization to the disability population at large, but also um, not, not fully explaining the, how the interventions will, will, um, will um, impact the policies of certain groups, specifically of people with disabilities. And then Heather, you can move on to the next slide. Inclusion is the act of creating a support, a supportive and respectful environment where everyone's talents are valued, celebrated and empowered and they feel empowered to participate fully. So what does inclusion look like and prioritization of disability and health research? Um, accessible language, so basically the opposite of what I just had on the first slide. Um, accessible language and um, research protocols um, actively seeks people with lived experience like ourselves to be part of the research team. Um, inclusive environments should define roles and expectations and outline specific compensation guidelines and respect the time and effort of all members that contribute equally. Um, also within this is supporting their accommodation needs if, if they have any and acknowledging the time and effort and knowledge by providing um, adequate compensation. Yeah. So you can move on to the next slide and here I will be talking about idea and health research. So idea stands for include inclusion, diversity, equity, and access accessibility and anti-racism. And this is a quote that I got um, from this book that I that I really um, that I really think explains why idea is important. And and it it says idea works to build on the legacy of social justice and civil rights movements. It aims to create organizations and societies. that population is perceived as trustworthy, safe, and representative, respectful, and accountable, and grounds itself in outcomes like success, sustainability, health, and general well-being in the service of systemic change. Idea is trying to change trying to change not just the hearts, but the minds of individuals, but also the, the structure, culture, strategy, policy, process, and practice of organizations. Thanks, Logan. So now this part of the webinar will take a look at some key concepts that should be considered when prioritizing disability inclusion in health research. 
So specifically, I will discuss the systems of inequality and the concepts of privilege and power. I just wanted to bring up that although not technically included in the slides, we could also bring up a social identity, so social categories on how we perceive ourselves and how others may perceive us, such as our gender, race, and disability. Our positionality is also important because it helps us view how we view the world around us. And it's important to note that social identities and positionality also intersect with one another. So because of this, because of these factors, we can have limited applicability that may not accurately represent populations because these factors aren't considered and overall resulting in a lack of health care for, for our specific population. Heather, if you could change the slide, please. So in regards to the systems of inequality at the top, you the top, you have the advantages that someone else may not. The middle, the structures that are produced and maintain inequality, such as ableism, and the bottom, so people who are disadvantages that they do not have access. So basically they cannot access healthcare because of these disadvantages created by the system, such as thinking about homelessness and having technological access, such as e-healthcare. Uh, there's certain types of disadvantages include individual, such as biased beliefs through actions and word that can negatively impact individual health care. Stereotypes, so thinking women are more prone to depression than men. There's also institutional so you have your formal groups or your written or non-written statements, how things should go in an organization or workplace, uh, gender, age, or physical disability, such as there's the stereotype that remote jobs equals someone may or may not be lazy. And then lastly, there is structural factors where social groups may not experience the same as other groups. And again, this is deeply rooted in society and can impact health outcomes. Uh, Heather, if you could switch the slide, please. So in terms of privilege and power, privilege is the advantage of particular group over another due to social categories. So examples would include marginalized groups, uh, having limited lab time access, uh, the use of indigenous language, systemic racism and discrimination, uh, SES status, accessible access, ableism. So in terms of research, privilege can impact healthcare and persons with disabilities in terms of general access to resources. So funding, network support, ideas that may align with more privileged groups. So selecting research topics, this as well can lead into what others may think is more important, thus making less other communities visible. Um, there's also the assumption and biases that can be embedded where the study design, they may not automatically think what may be accessible to another or other individuals, so they may want to focus, or they may want to focus on one type of specific disability and not include others. Uh, they may not consider practical barriers, making it less inclusive, such as accessible facilities and transportation and language. So overall, privilege and power can impact how we interpret our findings. And if it doesn't align with what we know, this leads to, uh, and negative health outcomes. So I'll pass it on to Tommy. All right, thanks, uh, Heather, you can change the slide. All right, so I'm handling tokenism and infantilization, which usually go hand in hand. Tokenism is defined by the act of using marginalized people in a performative way to give a false appearance of inclusivity. It is trying to make yourself look good by including people that are marginalized, but not actually having them be um, meaningful partners, just having them be sort of like a little placeholder. Tokenism can easily lead to work exploitation, a feeling of insignificance, and an aversion to be involved in health research because you are once again feeling like your opinion and your time and your effort is not valued. You can switch, Heather. 
this is a non-exhaustive checklist of ways that you might be experiencing tokenism, such as being asked to be part of a project last minute, such as like right before a grant deadline with little support or clarification. And usually there's a lot of grants where um, patient uh, having a patient partner is mandatory to get the funding. So trying to sort of shoe her, shoe horn somebody in last minute to get the grant approval, but not actually caring about them and not actually being willing to listen to their input, just wanting them to be a sort of placeholder. Um, there's also not really getting a chance to give input or you give input multiple times and you see that nothing has changed. You see that it's not being implemented. And also just being thrust in the middle of a non-inclusive environment as Logan talked about before and not having a lot of support, sort of being, sort of feeling like you're left by yourself. Another one is having your compensation not discussed and not being recognized if you work really hard on a research project with another researcher and you suddenly find that there's no mention of you in the paper, you're just referred to as an anonymous individual, your compensation is not talked about or it is shied away upon. Another big tell is that there's very few other marginalized people on the team, if it's a larger team, or if there is, there's a few roles that are aimed towards marginalized people, but you see that there's always turnover. There's always people leaving and coming and leaving and coming, usually because the environment isn't actually supportive or they are being a victim of uh, an inclusive environment. And lastly, despite expertise, you are fund fundamentally treated as if you are less knowledgeable. There are a lot of ways that tokenism can sort of make itself known to you. Um, but a big way of combating that would be employers or primary investigators to really have a very clear and very direct constant stream of communication with their patient partners, also for patient partners to form their own groups, their own networks that they can discuss among other patient partners because a large issue of tokenism is that even though it is a systematic issue in healthcare related research, the whole point of it is to sort of enact its clause on one particular person. So you feel tokenized and it's sort of just you as an individual, but you, it's not like it acts as a group, but also mainly impacts the individual. So when you have these networks and these big teams, you can talk to each other. You That's where tokenism will start to crumble because you will get advice from other people, other um, people with lived experience and other patient partners so that you can kind of be clocked into what's happening and that you can kind of realize how the way you're being treated is not similar to how other people are being treated or maybe you're all being treated in a inappropriate way. So a good way is to have big networks and talk to people and for primary investigators to always be talking to their patient partners and making sure that they are all right. Next slide, Heather. Lastly is infantilization. As I said before, tokenism and infantilization, they often go hand in hand, especially for patient partners that are disabled. Disabled people in research are usually, they're often led to either not, not being included in healthcare roles at all or being tokenized and infantilized due to perceived incapability. Only being hired or only being led onto the team because of a grant requirement, but either not truly really caring about their opinion or treating them as if they are a child. Infantilization has a lot of different faces, but specifically with, with people with experience and disabled people in healthcare research, it can look like over explaining very simple terms and only when not requested by the person with lived experience. It can look like speaking to caregivers or aides instead of directly to the person with lived experience, such as, um, if someone has a caregiver or an aide and directing all questions that are aimed towards person with lived experience to the caregiver, like, oh, would X like to do this? Would X like to do that when the person is standing right there? And not actually, which is just really not taking um, the person's communication or the or the person's needs seriously and just treating them as if a little, like if they're a little child. And also just not taking requests and comments seriously um, treating things the person with the experience says with sort of laughter or with an air of not pleasantries, but just being, I can't find the word for it, 
But when somebody isn't just not taking you seriously and they're just kind of laughing at the end of every sentence, they're really not listening to what you are saying or they think that what you're saying is too out of the water, it's too this, it's too that. Um, but yeah, those are basically a lot of different kinds of infantilization and um, a good way that this can be targeted is again, building up a lot of different structures with other people with experience to say, hey, did you notice that this person always treats me like this? This, um, And also just in general, having an open line of communication with your PI and for PIs to actually have a network of disabled people that they know in real life, because often people infantilize disabled people because they do not know any, dis any disabled people themselves. So actually in their personal circle, knowing and making an effort to include disabled people in their day-to-day -day life will have a big impact on how they treat disabled people in the workforce and in the research world. That's all for me. Heather, you can switch. So these are just our materials and references, and now we'll go into our Q&A for the second half of the session. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Logan, Tommy, and and Kelsey. Uh, so yeah, we're happy to uh, take any 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 questions from the from the audience. So feel free to to raise your hand or uh, add a a comment or a question in the chat, and we'll be sure to uh, uh, to to engage our our facilitators today. Um, I mean, I can get things going. So thank you so much for um for 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 giving this talk today, and I'm. At the outset, um, so let's say I am a new investigator and I'm just uh, you know starting down this road of patient-oriented research and I'm engaging uh, partners with lived experience. What would what would you suggest is the best way to start having those conversations? Um, if especially if if those projects do work with the, with uh, the disability community, what would be the best way to get insights on uh, those types of accommodations that would best facilitate um, the the relationship within the context of, of that particular research project. I think just just like what Tommy said is creating a network of people with disabilities that you that you know um, in your personal life so that you can get used to having conversations that aren't tokenistic and that aren't infantilizing um and then hopefully being able to transfer those conversation skills onto um onto your work and finding disabled consultants like ourselves um to join your team and just uh just making sure that you listen to the person with lived experience their feedback and um accommodate the accommodate them as best as possible. Kelsey and Tommy, do you have anything else to say? I think one of the things I would probably add is, you know, if you're looking to add people to your team and whatnot, is to make sure to create an uh what do they call it? A safe space. And I think they also started discussing what is also known as a brave space. So making sure that everybody remains heard and also asking, this might be controversial in some, but I was told that it's also important to ask how the participants would like to participate as well, like what they're looking to get out of the research uh, and the opportunity to participate in the research itself. I think that could also open the floor to, you know, creating more, what's the word? More of a, room for respect and you know being able to do things coherently and in a trustful manner do you have any other thoughts uh, following up on that tommy i don't i would just say to yeah i pretty much everything that kelsey said oh, perfect Excellent. i do so notice I... that we have some comments yeah. in the chat 
Yeah, thank you, Logan. Yeah, I, was, I see we have at least hand up as well. So we have a, a comment from from Nick. I'm happy to read that that out. Um, and yeah, it's a, I think it's a really important question to ask as well. So I'll just read it out verbatim, and uh, again, we'll offer it to you three to uh, to comment on. So Nick says that uh, my team would like to implement a project with a partnership made up of those with lived experience to receive funding so that the partners may be compensated for their time. We will be required to submit a research protocol for. Uh, for a grant. What are your thoughts on developing a research protocol before the partners are present? Yes, yeah, a very timely and difficult question, especially in those situations where you aren't uh, preemptively set up to, um, you know, compensate your partners for that, for that initial um, uh, element of the project. So, uh, so any thoughts um, uh, for, from Logan, Tommy, and, and Kelsey? I would just say that the very fact that you're thinking about compensating um, your patient partners um, with lived experience shows that you're you um, you're putting effort into into um, meaningfully engaging them in the work because compensation is one of those um, things that make the environment more inclusive and and um, frankly engages people more um, more often than not in health research because their it's uh compensation can be like an accent an incentive um so i i think in terms of making a protocol because because for the fact that you don't have the funds right now to support in this way in terms of compensation it, that's totally okay not to include um people with lived experience in that particular part of the protocol but i would just think about once you do hopefully get that grant and funding that you continue to engage people with lived experience throughout the project Uh, thank you, Logan. Uh, so I was just, Cal just throwing out to Kelsey and, and Tommy if you have any anything to add to that. I guess I would just add that I, you know, especially since you're you're in the middle of developing a protocol, and like Logan said, it's not official yet. I think one of the things that would be important to keep in mind is that to keep communication open and remain explicit in terms of what the uh, goals are and what the the next processes are going to be, especially, you know, if you're, you're wanting to compensate. So I think I would just, you know, maintain explicit about the guidelines and what's upcoming and maintain consistent contact, you know, make sure nothing's lost in translation as time goes on. Thank you, Kelsey. And I think, uh, yeah, but uh, Nick's comment, I think speaks to a larger issue with just how we do fund these this type of work. Um, so I, I, I do think that the current environment is not exactly conducive to uh, engaging PWLEs at the start when you are developing the protocol. And, you know, sometimes you do run the risk of kind of bringing them in near the end where you maybe you already have the plan set forward of how you are approaching approaching the work. So I'm hoping that down the line, we'll, we'll see funding structures that are a bit more amenable to that process where um, perhaps there are some sort of seed funding available to teams where they can and then you know dutifully engage partners right at the time uh, when they are developing their protocols from the from the beginning. Uh, so that said, I think I have Elix's hand up next. So we'll uh, switch over to you, Elix. Tommy did have a response to that question oh, in the oh, chat. Oh, oh my bad, Tommy. Um if if Pierre, you could read it out. Sure, okay. I can read it out. So sorry. So Alex, apologies. Before we go over to you, we'll uh, read through Tommy's comment. Uh, so Tommy says, sometimes deadlines for projects on patient partners are not uh, are not actually inclusive of patient partner inclusion, which is super unfortunate. Which is a super unfortunate paradox that seems to be happening here. Uh, I always think that consultation with patient partners first is uh, uh, very important as uh, starting an entire project about us without us seems counterintuitive. Um, I'd encourage to get patient partner input beforehand, even, even if with an external patient partner group, just to make sure no obvious bases aren't covered. Of course, that's not always possible. Uh, it's very situation dependent. Either way, like Logan said, really nice that you're already thinking uh, this far ahead. So thank you, Tommy. <laughs> Excellent. Now over to you, Elise. 
Thank you. And uh, I have to say that I've really enjoyed the presentation and uh, the nuggets of information that you shared with us. Um, I have two questions. The first one is um, what tips and um, suggestions would you give to PWLEs? Um, and that includes um, people from different um, groups, uh, minorities, et cetera. Um, when they are in a situation where they are being uh, uh, talked to as an, for example, as an infant, or they're being um, in a situation where it feels tokenistic, um, do you have tips on how they should react to that and um, how they should engage with the researchers? And the second point that I wanted to make is this, is that this webinar is so interesting and you've shared valuable information. Um, do you plan on doing like an infographic or a tip sheet? We can share that on our KT library. And also you can do additional presentations with research projects, um, webinars, that would be really rich and enrich enriching. Thank you. Sorry, Alex, I didn't quite catch your first question. Yeah, I caught the second part of perhaps making like an info sheet, which I don't know if Logan and Tommy would be interested, but I wouldn't mind doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, my first question was about giving um, tips and suggestions to uh, PWLEs if they find themselves in situations that feel uh, tokenistics or if they're in a conversation with someone and they are feeling infantil I don't know why I cannot pronounce that word. They are being, they feel like they're being talked to like a child. Um, and that happens also if, if, if you're in different minority groups, it happens. And sometimes it's hard to react on the spot. Like you can have an ally next to you who can talk not for you, but express what you're feeling because you're like the deer in the headlight and you feel like you, you cannot react on spot. So do you have tips for PWLEs when they find themselves in this situation, these kinds of situations? So I didn't touch upon this when I was speaking, but I looked at it a little bit just on my free time and whatnot. I think I could I'll say speaking for persons with lived experience as well as the researchers in terms of feeling like tokenism and whatnot. Again, I think it's important to create a safe environment. And, you know, if you're feeling those concerns that, you know, it's okay to express those concerns. And I didn't touch upon this, but, you know, remaining reflexive. So, you know, being aware of what your potential biases are and, you know, how can you mitigate those? Uh, whether, you know, if it's, Maybe you're not even conscious of them, perhaps, you know, just being reflexive and, you know, making sure that it's always a learning process, right? One of the practices um, that we do in one of the one of the projects that I am on currently outside of child right is is um, filling out this like reflexive document where we answer like simple questions about how we felt during the meeting and um, and like if we felt our our contributions were being heard and if we um, basically if we felt that our contributions were being implemented and I find that just filling out that document and like having the research team even be aware that 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 might be something anonymous that people want to fill out on their on their own. Like, I feel like that in itself creates an environment that um, supports me in coming forward if I ever feel um, um, excluded from any conversation. And then even sometimes we do we do the sheet all as one team. So that if if somebody has a complaint that everyone that everyone has a similar thought about, then we we can use that 
10 minutes at the end of every meeting to discuss why multiple members of that team are feeling that way. Uh, for me personally, something that really helped me when I was first starting out in patient partnership was um, for the way that it was sort of structured is that there were like three researchers and then there were maybe five uh, patient partners. And it was very helpful to have one of those patient partners be very, very assertive and he knew what he was doing and he was very loud and he was very opinionated because when things were happening to me in the moment where um, I was just starting out, I felt that something was a little off about the way they were engaging me, but I couldn't put words to it. He very quickly put words to it in the middle of a meeting. He was very upfront and it was um, even like it was because he had so much experience and because he was also somebody that didn't back down very easily. Um, it really helped me in finding the words for what I was feeling and it really helped them. The, the researchers realized that some of the practices that they were doing were a little suspect. So I would just say like having someone in your group that is just like in your interviews, you can see that they are very passionate and that they will not really let things slide and they will hold you accountable. Also what Logan said, just having little anonymous, um, anonymous sheets that people can fill out at the end of meetings to see if things are actually being heard. And just in general, like I said, having networks of other patient partners that you can talk to if something is feeling a little off, but you can't really put words behind it. This is really good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great question, Alix, and uh, and to our, our, our facilitators for uh, the really uh, fulsome response. So. Um, I'm just going to the chat real quick, and I see that uh, Heather just going back to that uh, idea of perhaps having some pot of funds available when you are developing your projects. Uh, there is mention of some uh, accelerator funding program, and I know that um, the, the sport program is currently doing a refresh, uh, so hopefully uh, some of that advocacy work for that type of opportunity um, will be um, available in the, in, 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 in the next rounds of, of funding that are, that are announced. And it's Akiko, I see that you have your hand up. So I will hand it over to you. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, very, yeah, inspiring webinar. And then I'm learning a lot. And thank you so much for, yeah, this opportunity. And just, uh, it's, yeah, that uh, the checklist for that tokenism, I thought that's like a very helpful. And yeah, I, I'm glad to, yeah. I've seen that. And then I think my question is, I, I guess, yeah, uh, you may have touched upon, but sometimes this type of checklist can become like a checklist and then without having like a meaningful like discussion or that sort of uh, reflection. So I'm just wondering, yeah, like if you want to use that checklist, like what would be your recommendations for researchers so that we don't actually tokenize that tokenized tokenism checklist, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I, I understand what you mean. That makes a lot of sense actually. There's a lot of times where researchers like they just see checklist and they don't actually take the time to engage. Like the whole point of the checklist is to engage with other people to find out like if what you're doing is appropriate and to find out what other people are thinking of you. It's not just to put a check on it which is what sometimes some people default to. So I would just say the best remedy for that is just open communication and making sure that there's like an actual, um, that you know the people that you're doing research with well, that you actually, um, that you actually care about their opinions, that you actually care about what they're saying. Because if you don't, then maybe patient-oriented research is not for you. But just in general, making sure that you have at least just the willingness to learn and the willingness to listen and the willingness to know when you're wrong, if you're wrong, and having both a strong team of researchers that will that are very varied in opinion, so that they will also check you, and also having a varied list of of patient partners. So yeah, having a good having a good network of people surrounding you, so that they can also point things out if you're just using a checklist, and if you're seeing that oh people are actually saying no, and 
having a good relationship with your patient partners that they actually feel comfortable in saying, yeah, I don't I like actually uh, I didn't check this part of the checklist and I want to tell you about why that is. Thank you. Just over to 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 Logan Akasi, if you have anything to add to to that question from Sakiko. No, I think uh, Tommy Tommy answered it quite well. Um, so I have nothing nothing further to add, Kelsey. I don't really have too much to add either, considering Tommy was pretty much going to say what I was going to say. So I think it's a good response. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, so that idea of being open, being honest, being vulnerable is super important when you are sort of holding that uh, initiating I mean, I guess, those relationships, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess this is just, you know, especially if you want to engage patient partners, I think per, I've seen this a few times that instead of a checklist, if you want to engage patient partners to, to create kind of like a matrix table to see where they would like to be involved at certain processes. But I know this might be a bit more complex for the presentation at the moment. Thanks for sharing the idea. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. And uh, Annette, over to you. Thank you. So I just want to thank Logan, Kelsey, and Tommy really for a very interesting webinar, really pulling out the key concepts um, about what dis disability inclusion, including youth, uh, engaging youth in meaningfully and authentically, and some of the things to really be careful of. Um, I really liked Alix's idea of an infographic where some of these concepts are defined and then the do's and don'ts. So like the way you did inclusive versus non-inclusive. So what non-inclusive looks like and then how inclusion should look like. So really giving a sense of what to avoid, but also how to prioritize um, and really succeed in terms of include, including uh, youth with disabilities in, in research. Um, so I really encourage you to do that. And it's something we can share with others and can benefit others. So thanks so much for your uh, very thoughtful comments. I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Annette. So I'm seeing we still have a bit of time left. So uh, if anyone has any further questions uh, to ask of our facilities today, uh, we certainly can uh, hang on for, for a bit longer. So feel free to uh, to add it in the chat or raise your hand. We'll be happy to to hand the mic over to you. Uh, that that said, um, if you if you have, if you have any questions, uh, maybe after the session, feel free to reach out to me, and I can certainly uh, circulate the, the question to uh, to Kelsey, Logan, and Tommy uh, for some input, and we're happy to get in touch with you with uh, with uh, with a response. So, um, yeah, thank you uh, again, all three of you, for a really a really great and engaging session. I really hope that this is a, a start of maybe a, a series we do because uh, we certainly can dive into some of these topics in a lot more detail so uh, hopefully we can put that on the calendars and uh, and, uh, and 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 keep you all engaged um, as we uh, delve into these a bit more uh, a bit more deeper so yeah thank you thank you so much so let's uh, let us know if you have any parting comments um, if not we will be happy to uh, follow up with the uh, with the attendees later today with uh, maybe a recording of the of this session um, as well as a bit of a feedback survey where you can highlight uh, some of the uh, some future sessions you might want to see addressed, and if it's specific, specific to this topic, I'll be happy to share it with uh, with Logan, Kelsey, and and Tommy. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Well, well uh, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any other questions pop up, so uh, we can give you 15 minutes back in uh, in your day, and uh, yeah, look forward to connecting with you again next time. Until then, take care. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.